Today's webinar is conducted by the wonderful Saul Glazer, a Wisconsin construction lien law expert. Today's webinar topic is protecting against price escalation and unavoidable delays in materials. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the fabulous Saul Glazer. Thank you very much, Jessica. Um, so today we're, uh, we're going to be talking about um, uh, how, how to deal with price escalation and unavoidable delays. And so um, it, there's ways, if you have questions, you can ask questions at the end and we'll answer them. Um, you type them in. Um, don't include your company name in the questions. Um, there'll be a chat box that you can type them in and we'll answer the questions at the end. This this will last about 15, 20 minutes tops. Um, and the whole point is to try to get you guys focused on uh, what might happen uh, in the next uh, year or two in terms of where things are going with the construction industry um, and so how you can better protect yourself in case you, you guys run into problems in terms of not having proper uh, materials available or um, labor available. So all of you would have lived through COVID. Um, I'm a construction lawyer and for the most part, the th kinds of things I was dealing with with, with COVID um, were l lumber prices skyrocketed um, and also um, a lot of times steel prices went up and then the other piece was um, windows like uh, we had trouble getting windows for a lot of projects I remember one apartment building we actually built the whole building and then had to put the windows in as the last step which completely you know resequenced all the work and made everything a lot more difficult this time around um you know i'm not going to get political here there's really three ways things can go uh with the trump administration one things can get better um which would be great uh, two would be things would be kind of same old, same old for the next year or two. Uh, and the third thing would be we could see some uh, kind of drastic changes because of either the tariffs or because of immigration prop policies if we start seeing uh, impacts on the, the labor market. Um, and so the question is, what can you guys do if you end up with problems in terms of um, not being able to get materials on time or material prices going up or if you're having labor problems? So with respect to um, what you do, if you're a general contractor, it's different than if you're a subcontractor. Um, everybody wants to know what things are gonna cost. And, and the reason why people need to know what things are gonna cost is because for all these projects, you got budgets, you got a developer who's got X dollars. Uh, if it's a governmental ent entity, they have a certain amount of money allocated for a project. Nobody wants to see price increases because they don't have the money allocated to pay for it. So they don't have the financing, um, they don't have the government funds. Um, if you're a general contractor, you need to know what your subcontractors are gonna cost. So everybody wants to know what the price is gonna be before you start the work. The problem is when you have uh, unanticipated labor and material shortages, you think the price is gonna be one thing and all of a sudden you can't get something and you gotta order something. I know how oh, the other piece that we had during COVID, we had a lot of problems with electrical things. Um, there was issues with China where um, control panels were unavailable. So like we, and I think on one project, we ended up using all used parts on part of the electrical system and then replaced them with new, with new parts later on because we had to get the building open. So you, you can run into all these weird kind of problems. So there's really two ways that contractors and subcontractors can protect themselves. Um, and one of the problems is that, you know, if you're a subcontractor, you know, it's basically all or nothing that, you know, you sign the subcontract um, or you're not getting the job. And so one thing you need to think about in all your projects, and, and this also applies if you're a general contractor, is some of the best decisions that you can make is deciding not to sign a contract because, um, you know, there's more times than I can count where someone says, you know, I knew there was a red flag up front on this project, but, you know, the price looks so good. We went, we went ahead. We signed the contract and it's just been a disaster ever since. So understand what you're going to sign before you're going to sign it. And also understand some of your best power and some of your best decision making process might be not to do a certain project because there's some red flags up front or there's some un unknowns that you can't take care of. But before you sign the contract, understand that there's really two ways to protect yourself against material uh, price escalation. One and labor shortage. One is a force majeure clause, and force majeure is a Latin term, and it basically just means something that's unanticipated. Um, and so it's it, the purpose of a force majeure clause, and it's not in all contracts, so 
make sure your, your general contract has one, make sure your subcontract has a force majeure clause. And it's gonna say um, that if they're unexpected occurrences that you might either get more time or more money or both and understand that sometimes you just get time and time doesn't translate into money. And if you're late and you have extra time on a job, it's definitely better than getting nailed with liquidated damages but you also have more expenses every day on a job, you're incurring more and more costs. So ideally, if you're a general or your subcontractor, if you're getting triggered to a force majeure clause, you're gonna want both time and money in the contract. Um, so but the force majeure clauses are not designed specifically to handle uh, material price increases and labor shortages. They can sometimes apply in that situation, but they're not gonna be the end all be all. So just because you have a force majeure clause doesn't necessarily protect you if there's price material price uh, increases for materials or labor problems. Um, most for, force majeure clauses are going to say that has to be un, unexpected. So for example, with COVID-19, COVID-19 is already happening. So it, you may not be able to trigger a, a force majeure clause if you had another outbreak in COVID-19. So when I put um, a force majeure clause in for my clients, I always say, uh, for epidemics, pandemics, including but not limited to COVID-19. So if there's another, you know, secondary outbreak of COVID-19, I'm covered on the force majeure clause. So the two main contracts that are, you'll see out there um, for construction projects um, are AIA and consensus documents. This is the AIA force majeure clause. And so this is how you're going to get more money or more time if you're the general contractor. And then for the uh, subcontractor, you'd have to be able to be bound to this contract and be able to take advantage of it to be able to use it. So the clause says, if the contractor is delayed at any time in the commencement or progress of the work by an act or neglect of the owner or employee um, or by changes order in the work because of labor disputes, fire, unusual delays and deliveries, unavoidable casualties or other causes beyond the contractor's control. So it has to be beyond the contractor's control. And that also means it also has to be beyond the subcontractor's control. And then um, it's something that justifies the day delay, then the contract time shall be extended. So the standard AIA clause only gives you extra time. You could, if you're the general contractor, add the, the contract time and some shall be equitably extended for a reasonable time um, and for a reasonable cost. Um, but that those type of issues could potentially trigger extra money for you, but it's not gonna cover every type of situation that could be potentially um, caused because of material shortage or labor shortages. Um, the consensus force majeure clause is sim uh, similar. It says the example of causes beyond the control of the contract constructor, they use the word constructor and consensus, not contractor, include acts or omissions of the owner, changes in the work, uh, sequences, hazardous materials, concealed or own, unknown conditions. So they include their uh, different site condition clause within that delay authorized by the owner, labor disputes not involving the, the constructor. Um, so it has to be a labor dispute outside of the constructor's own labor, general labor disputes impacting the uh, project, fire, terrorism, epidemics. So they say epidemics. I would also add pandemics for both um, this and the AIA clause. And also I would say including but not limited to COVID-19. Um, and then adverse government actions, unavoidable actions. So, um, and this also just talks about time. So you'd also want to include some contract sum if you can, or contract price for consensus if you can, so that you can get an equitable adjustment for both. But again, these clauses cover a certain thing, but they don't co cover everything that potentially could be um, caused because of material price or labor shortages. So consensus came up with a form called the 200.1 form. And this is a form you should use. You can buy it off of consensus. Um, consensus documents are really good. And you can use this even if you're doing an AI contract. You can always add uh, in, in a, an exhibit to an AI contract. And the way this form works um, is that it talks about specifically uh, situations where you have a list of potential items that might go up in price. And so you list them out and, you, and then you list out what, what the value is that you're assuming the value is at the time you're starting your contract. And then from there, if the price goes up, then you can get the, the differential um, price. So it's based on a baseline price. And also it also has a potential time uh, impact. 
and you, you put that on the original contract, and if things change, then you basically get a de facto change order for the extra price and extra time if things end up getting delayed. Um, and so you adjust the price um, by showing the person that this price went up, and it has to be on the list of the people of the um, items that you put in. So if you didn't put an item in with a baseline price, that wouldn't be subject to the price escalation. And usually it's a negotiated process as to what items you can put on this list up front as part of the contract do documents. And if the price goes down, um, then you also lose money in this situation uh, if you use the standard form, because the whole idea is the price may go up, the price may go down. If you remember during COVID, lumber prices went up and they also went down. Um, another way to handle this whole thing is if you're unsure about certain prices, if you can get the owner or the general contractor to use an allowance item, allowance items are just estimates. And so if you had an allowance item for like $100,000, for lumber and the and the lumber price came in at 150,000, you get 150 grand for it. But if the lumber price came in at 75, you get 75 for it. So uh, in addition to just using a price escalation clause, you could also try to use a lumber um, or an, an allowance for specific items as well, which is another way to to make the um, price floating throughout the price process. Um, and then you can also um, uh, use this uh, consensus document to deal with um, time impact because of deliveries. Um, this doesn't specifically cover time impact because of labor sh shortages, but you could add in language in your contract that would say, um, you know, if, if there are unanticipated labor problems, um, then we get extra time. Um, typically for labor, you would just get extra time um, if you had a labor shortage, but um, theoretically, you could also ask for an equitable adjustment in the contract price. So the big question is, you know, how do you protect yourself? And the way to protect yourself, if you're a general contractor, is to try to bake in in your contract when you sign it with the owner potentials for items that that you know can fluctuate in price and address that up front before you sign the contract um, and put in something like the the consensus 200.1 form and use that with the exhibit um, and then. In terms of uh, potential labor shortages, if you're in an area where you think you might be impacted, if um, immigration starts going sideways, um, you may want to put something in your contract saying, "Look, um, you know, at this point in time, you know, we're not sure what our labor situation is. Um, in the event that um, you know there's a material change in our availability of labor, we can get an equitable uh, increase in the contract price and the contract sum." Uh, you know, obviously owners are going to try to push back on this as much as possible, but, you know, sometimes there's a middle ground to try to get something. Another thing that can, you can do is um, with price increases, you can say that they won't exceed a certain amount. So you can ask for price escalation clauses, but they have a cap um, or they won't go below a certain amount if they went, if the prices went down. If you're a subcontractor, um, you're not going to have the, the consensus document with the owner, but the way to get into that would be in your subcontract, you would include language saying that the subcontractor binds itself to contractor under the subcontract. You have a flow down provision that's binding you to their contract um, with respect to the subcontract work is the same in the same manner as the contractor is bound to the owner, but on the same um, situations, um, you're getting the same benefit that the contractor has against um, the owner as the um, as the uh, as you against the contractor. So subcontractors shall have the same benefits of all rights and memories towards the contractor as contractor has towards the owner. So if you put yourself in the shoes of the owner of the contractor going against the owner, then if the contractor has the um, consensus document, then you can use that and then put your own schedule on and use that as well. Now, um, you should always, as a subcontractor, look and see what the general contract is between the owner and the and the general contractor, because if you're binding yourself, and most subcontracts are going to have what's called a flow down provision, you're going to want to make sure that you're agreeing to the clauses that you can live with um, and, and understand, you know, if you're going to get nailed with liquidated damages or um, if, you, you know, what the change clause is going to be, um, whether or not you can lean the project. So you should always try to understand what you're binding yourself to when you sign a subcontract that says that you're going to be bound to the uh, prime contract. 
So um, the bottom line is we're gonna we're in a new era coming uh, in, in January. Um, let, let's hope for the best, um, but be prepared that you know things might change and, and there might be some problems uh, ahead that we, we may not be able to anticipate. And the best way to handle that is to understand your contracts, read your contracts, never just blindly sign uh, a contract. I represent tons of contractors. I represent tens of subcontractors. And there's nothing worse than when I get a claim in uh, where I have to get involved and my client hasn't read the contract and all of a sudden I read the contract and there's all this weird language in it. I mean, there can be weird language. I just yesterday was dealing with changing a, a, a lien form that was basically a lien form, but it was also releasing all claims. So just always read everything before you sign it. If you don't understand it, find someone who does understand it. Talk to someone who can help you so that you understand what you're signing because words have you know consequences. And if you sign bad documents, um, maybe nine times out of 10, you escape problems. But that 10th time, it could be the difference between staying in business or going out of business. So be very careful and, and also always do things in writing. When people do oral change orders or when people do oral contracts, they always change when you try to get your money. Uh, um, that's one thing I've found in my career is that you know people say, oh, well, the guy told me I was going to get extra money for doing this. And then lo and behold, there's nothing. At a minimum, put something in an email, get them to confirm it in an email. Um, but you should use contracts whenever possible and always make sure everything's in writing. So with that, um, I don't, if there's any questions, um, you can go ahead. Otherwise, uh, have a great afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, Saul. Can you go to the next slide for us, please? Oh, sorry, sure. <laughs> thank you. Um, that was really incredible. Thank you again. Um, Yes, if you guys have a contract, please, please, please make sure you guys are reading what you're signing. If you're confused, please reach out to an attorney, um, reach out to Saul, whoever it might be, just so you can better understand your document and know what it is that you're signing and agreeing to. Um, we do have a question that came through. It says, if you have a contract baseline price and your account and you account for, let's say, 15% increase, but the tariffs cause an increase of 23% to potentially, what can you do about the discrepancy or do you just have to eat that that difference? Yeah, if, if there's a baseline and it's hit and it has a max that can't go above a certain amount, then you're stuck. Um, yeah, and the, and the tariffs are probably not gonna be one to one. The, the, the way the tariffs are probably gonna impact things are, are, are unfortunately, the, I think there's gonna be some, you know, depending on how they hit, there might be delays for like, for example, a window manufacturer that gets part of their parts from China, they may end up like having delays in their production because all of a sudden the tariffs may impact pricing and then they may end up trying to order places, order from different places where the tariffs aren't being hit. So yeah, it's gonna be touch and go for the next, you know, probably six to eight months until people figure it out, but just be careful. And, you know, if you can get, you know, if, ideally your best, that is, if you can just have an allowance for certain items that where the prices are going to fluctuate, then then it's just the actual price as opposed to a baseline price with you know a cap. But you don't need to have a cap on a baseline price. But some will say, yeah, no more than 15% or more than no more than 20%. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for that clarification. Um, all right. That was the. Um, and I think that was it on the questions that were posed. If somebody does have another question that wasn't addressed, please feel to reach out and I'll be sure to answer any questions for you. Uh, can you go to the next slide for me, please? Sure. All right, here are some of Sunray's resources to help you stay organized, know your deadlines and secure your lien rights. So please go ahead, scan that QR code to access these incredible resources. All right, and then the next one. All right, if you can give us a moment of your time, we'd really appreciate it. Um, Go ahead and scan this QR code, give us some feedback um, on Google of what you thought of it, potentially what we can do better or other topics you want us to cover. We'd really appreciate any of the feedback. And then the last slide, if you don't mind. And with that, that is all we have for you guys today. Thank you so much for, to everybody who attended. We hope to see you at our next webinar. Again, Saul, thank you so much. You really are wonderful. I hope you all have a beautiful and wonderful sunny day. Thanks, everyone.